Hello and welcome to lesson 10 of 20 in the URSA campus breakdown course on introductory statistics and probability. This is module 2, probability, part 4, conditional probability. Let's get started. In the previous lesson, one topic we looked at was how to determine whether or not events are independent or dependent with respect to each other. Now we turn our focus primarily towards dependent events and how the probabilities of such events are conditional upon the occurrence or non-occurrence of their counterpart events. The following topics are covered. We look at the definition of conditional probability We'll use tree diagrams to solve problems. We'll look at conditional probability and independence and dependence. And we'll look at the theorem of total probability. As discussed in the previous lesson, when two events are independent with respect to each other, the occurrence or non-occurrence of one event has no bearing upon the occurrence or non-occurrence of the other event. In example one, if a coin is tossed and a die is rolled, then the probability that the die comes up one is constant, regardless of what happens with the coin toss. And similarly, the probability that the coin comes up heads is constant, regardless of what happens with the die roll. The same is true for all other possible combinations of outcomes for the coin and the die. The above is true because the die roll and the coin toss have no influence upon each other. So the natural next question to consider is, what if the events do have an influence upon each other? And it's this question that we consider in the next example. In example two, a fair coin is tossed three times. We define the event A as the event that the first toss comes up heads, and the event B is that the event that exactly two of the three tosses are heads. And we're asked to calculate the following. We're asked to calculate the probability of A, the probability of B, the probability of A intersection B, and the probability of B given that A occurs. So to answer these questions, first we start, we start by defining the sample space and determine the number of outcomes it contains. And we've seen the example of three coin tosses before. So we know that the total number of possible outcomes is two to the power of three or eight. And you should be well familiar by now with the actual sample space and what the outcomes look like. So to answer the question in part A, we simply list all of the outcomes where the first coin toss is heads and we see there's four of those and so the number of outcomes is equal to four and there and if we can if we assume that the coin is fair as is stated in the question then we have equally likely outcomes in the sample space and so therefore we we can say that the probability of a is equal to four over eight which equals one half In part B, we're looking at the event that there are two heads out of three, and we see that there are three possible outcomes. So the number of outcomes in set in event B is three, and therefore the probability of B is three eighths. The intersection of events A and B is the intersection of is the situation where we have heads on the first toss and a total of two heads, which gives us heads, heads, tails, or heads, tail, heads. And so we have the number of outcomes there equaling two. So the probability of A intersection B equals two over eight, which is one quarter. Now to answer part D, what we do now is that if it's given that A occurs, then the event A is no longer an uncertain event. And so therefore, we have to consider that there's a new sample space, a reduced sample space compared to the overall one that we started with. For the purposes of answering this question, the sample space actually becomes the set A, which is the set of just those four outcomes where we have heads in the first toss. So 
So that's the way we answer this question. So the probability of event B, given that event A happens, would equal the number of outcomes where B happens as well as A, divided by the new sample space, which is the number of outcomes in A intersection B divided by the number of outcomes in A, which equals two out of the four. So the final answer reduces to one half. And you can see in the diagram on the slide here that if we show the set A, which is our, essentially our new sample space because we're assuming or it's given that A occurs, so we, we reduce the sample space to the set A. And you can see the four elements in A. And if you look at the set B, which only has which has three elements, what you see in the diagram circled in blue are the outcomes that are common to both A and B, and that's A intersection B. So you can see why the number of elements in the intersection is two. Notice that in the previous example, we ended up with the probability of B given A equaling the number of outcomes in A intersection B divided by the number of outcomes in A. Now, we can do a little bit of an algebraic uh, manipulation here, and we can divide both the top and the bottom by the same thing, and mathematically that that is we're allowed to do that um, because those two things just cancel each other out. Now, why do we do that? Well, the reason is if we divide each of the top, which is the which is the number of outcomes in A intersection B, and the bottom, which is the number of outcomes in A, if we divide each of them by the number of outcomes in the sample space, then what we get is that the top half, which we've circled in blue, which is the number of elements in A intersection B over the number of elements in S, well, that equals the probability of A intersection B from our previous definition for probability with equally likely outcomes. And similarly, on the bottom, N of A divided by N of S, well, that's equal to the probability of A. This gives us the general rule for conditional probability, which is that the probability of event B given event A is equal to the probability of A intersection B divided by the probability of A. And notice that the left side of the equation is written, it's got that vertical line. Uh, it's got B and then the vertical line and then A, and that's read as the probability of B given A. Note as well that the above equation only applies when the probability of A is not equal to zero. So um, in order to use this formula, the, the event A has to be an event with some probability um, and not an impossible event. So uh, an event that is um, has a probability not equal to zero, which would be greater than zero, of course. The above rule for conditional probability can be illustrated via a Venn diagram and the corresponding division of areas as follows. And you see in the diagram below, we, there's this Venn diagram and you've got the sets A and B as circles and they've got an overlapping region. And that overlapping region, that's A intersection B. Now, if we shade in, what we, in the, what we have here is that set A is shaded in in blue. And the probability of B given A is simply the probability, you notice how the denominator is just the circle for A and not the entire rectangle or entire box. So we've, it's essentially like we're reducing our sample space to just the set A and that's our denominator. And then for B to happen as well, we must be in the part of A that also includes B. So it equals that intersection area. So you can think of the formula above for conditional probability as, as essentially just a proportion of areas from a Venn diagram where we divide the intersection area by the area of A. Some problems involving conditional probability can be solved easily without using the previously stated formula. In example three, two cards are randomly drawn without replacement from a standard deck of playing cards. And we are asked to calculate the following. First, we're asked to calculate the probability that the second card is a club given that the first card is a club. 
And then in part B, we're asked to find the probability that the second card is a club, given that the first card is not a club. So to answer these questions, we start, we use it, we use a similar approach as in the previous lessons. And we're going to use these boxes here that has that have worked very well for us um, previously. So to answer the first question of the probability that the second card is a club, given that the first card is a club, we draw two boxes to represent the two cards. And notice that if we've got a club written down, uh, drawn in below each box, because um, to answer this question, the first card is a club, and then we're trying to find the probability the second card is a club as well. So both are clubs, but the first card is given. So we don't put a probability in there. It's essentially like putting in a one. It's certain that the first card is a club. So the only probability we're really interested in is that probability for the second card. So if it's given that the first card is a club, then our deck of 52 cards, the first card is a club. And so for the second choice, we only have 51 cards left. In other words, we've taken one card out. And now there's a total of 13 clubs in the deck. But if it's given that the first card is a club, then we know that there's only 12 of the 13 clubs left. So the probability of getting a club would be 12, which are the 12 remaining clubs out of the 51 cards in total. And that, that, so that means that our answer is 12 over 51, which reduces to 4 out of 17. In part B, we're asked to find the probability that the second card is a club, given that the first card is not a club. So this time what we do is we, our diagram shows that the first card is, we use the club complement symbol, which simply does, denotes that the first card is not a club. And the second card is to be a club. So the first card, not a club, that's given. So now we have 51 cards left, of which all 13 clubs must be still in the deck. So the answer to part B is 13 over 51. In example four, we ask the question, if two uncertain events, E and F, are mutually exclusive, what are the probability of E given F and the probability of F given E? So the answer to the question, to answer this question, we start by noting that if two events are mutually exclusive, then they cannot both occur. In other words, the probability of E intersection F is equal to zero. So therefore, the probability of E given F, which equals the probability of E intersection F over probability of F via the formula we just uh, derived, is equal to zero divided by the probability of F. So the answer is zero. And likewise, the probability of F given E would equal the probability of F intersection E, which is the same as E intersection F over the probability of E, which again is zero, this time over probability of E. But in either case, if, with, if you have zero in the numerator, you get an answer of zero. So in general then, the probability of B given A will equal the probability of A given B, which will both equal zero for any events A and B that are mutually exclusive. Problems involving dependent events can often be modeled very well and solved nicely using tree diagrams. For example, in the previous example we looked at a couple of examples ago where two cards are drawn without replacement from a standard deck of cards we could define the relevant events as follows we could say let a equal the event that the first card is a club and b equals the event that the second card is a club based on these definitions we can model the, the experiment via the tree diagram that you see on the slide. So the way it's constructed is we start from an initial point on the left, and then there the first stage is um, the the selection of the first card, and and either event A happens, which means you get a club, or event A complement happens, which means we don't get a club. And you can see the probabilities um, are put on the branches: the 13 out of 52 cards, or one quarter probability for getting a club and therefore 39 over 52 which is a three-quarter probability of getting uh, a complement which is not a club and you can see that the sum of the two branches coming up from the initial point has to add up to one so we have a quarter and three quarters 
And now we do the second stage from each of A and D complement. So event B is the event that you get a club on the second card. And you can see that the probability of getting B is different depending on what happened first. If A happened first, in other words, if you got a club, then the probability of getting another club is 12 over 51 or 4 seventeenths. And so the probability of B complement uh, given A would be 39 over 51, the other 39 cards, or 13 over 17. And of course, these numbers, once you know one of the branches here, you can calculate the other by just subtracting from one. Notice that 4 over 17 plus 13 over 17 is equal to 1. And similarly, uh, if, if the first card's not a club, then the probability of getting a club on the second is 13 out of 51, which means that the probability of not getting a club is 38 over 51. The following are key points about tree diagrams insofar as how they're applied to probability problems. And remember, the whole point here in using a tree diagram is to, is to make a challenging problem broken down and easier to solve. So it's a tool that's supposed to make things simpler and, and, and help you get to a solution. So first of all, wherever several branches come out of a single point, anywhere on a tree diagram, the sum of the probabilities on these branches is always equal to one. Each successive branching out is called a stage of the experiment. And an experiment with n levels of branching out is called an n stage experiment. The number of branches emerging from a single point anywhere on the tree has no upper limit theoretically. And it simply equals the number of different outcomes possible from that point for the stage in question. A path on the tree diagram goes from the initial starting point and is comprised of all of the successive branches branching outs from there until a terminal point at the other end of the diagram. First stage probabilities are simple probabilities for the events they pertain to. Subsequent stage probabilities are the conditional probabilities for the events they pertain to given the occurrence of the events on the preceding branches. And to calculate the probability that an experiment follows a certain path, you simply multiply each successive probability along that path. These rules are illustrated for the preceding problem as follows. Now you can see the tree diagram. This is a two-stage problem, and each stage happens to have two possible outcomes. Your first stage either has the event A or A complement, and at the second stage, you either have B or B complement. In example five, we refer back to the previous example with the clubs, choosing clubs in uh, two selections of cards. And we're asked to calculate the probability that both the first and second cards drawn are clubs. So to answer this question, we can look at the tree diagram and simply follow the path for which both events A and B occur. In other words, where both cards drawn are clubs. And you can see that that's the path that we circle in red in the tree. It's the path that starts from the beginning and goes to A and then from A goes to B. And what that is, that path represents A intersection B. And, to, and you can see that the probabilities on the branches, the first one is the probability of A. That's a simple probability because it's in the first stage. And then the second branch is the probability of B given A. And so to calculate the probability of A intersection B, we simply multiply the probability. So it will equal 13 over 52 times 12 over 51, which in its reduced form is 1 quarter times 4 over 17 which finally reduces to 1 over 17. Now, this result is consistent with the rule for conditional probability derived earlier. In other words, the probability of B given A should equal the probability of A intersection B divided by the probability of A, which if we rearrange gives us the formula that the probability of A intersection B equals the probability of A times the probability of B given A which if we work that out gives us 13 over 52 times 12 over 51, which gives us one quarter times four over 17 and the final answer of one over 17. Problems can be more complex such as in the following example. 
This is example six. Now this example doesn't have any specific values given. It's m meant more to be just a general example of a of one type of uh, problem in the, in the specific tree diagram that you would get. Um, of note in this example is that there are three stages and we can call them stages A, B, and C. The first stage has three possible outcomes, A1, A2, and A3, while the second and third stages have up to two possible outcomes each, B1, B2, or uh, and C1, C2. Now, also, there's some peculiarities that have just been put into this example just for the sake of showing some peculiarities. And one of them is that the outcome, um, if the outcome of the first stage is A2, then then only B1 can occur in the second stage. In other words, B, B for whatever reason, B2 cannot happen if A2 happens. And that might be something specific to the context of the problem. And similarly, we have the situation that if the outcome of the first stage is A3, and then the outcome of the second stage is B1, it just so happens that only C2 can occur in the third stage and not C1. The other thing that um, you should notice here is that the actual probabilities uh, that are written in blue on the tree, you can see that for the first stage, those are simple probabilities of A1, A2, and A3. In the second stage, we have conditional probabilities of uh, B1 or B2, given whether it's A1 or A2 or A3. So you can see, for example, the top one in the second stage is the probability of B1 given A1, and et cetera, for the ones uh, at below in the rest of the second stage. Now the third stage probabilities are also conditional probabilities, but they're taken one step further. They are conditional probabilities of C1 or C2 given what happens in stage A, whether it's A1 or A2 or A3, and what happens in the stage two, which is B1 or B2. So for example, we see that the, the top probability in the third stage is the probability of C1 given A1 and B1, or the probability of C1 given A1 intersection B1, and et cetera, for the rest of the probabilities in that third stage. In example seven, we have a jar that contains four red balls and two green balls. One ball at a time is randomly selected from the jar without replacement until a green ball is obtained. And we want to calculate the probability that three or fewer selections are required. Now, to answer this problem, uh, we need to take a look at the big picture here. A problem like this may seem very complicated at first glance. And this certainly is an example of a question that, that isn't necessarily that straightforward or self-evident. The answer will probably not just jump out of the out of the, the, the slide or the page at you. Um, but the use of a, a tool like a tree diagram here can really help you to visualize the problem and therefore solve it without too much difficulty. So for this problem, the number of possible selection selections can it be anywhere from one ball if the first ball selected is green all the way up to five, and that's because there's four red balls, and it's possible that if it, you could you could choose a red ball four times in a row, and if that happens, then you have to choose a green ball for the fifth one. So the number of selections will be anywhere between one and five, and we're particularly interested in the probability that there are three or fewer selections. So to answer this question, we only need to to look at the first three stages or the first three selections of a ball. And that is sufficient to answer the question. And that's really important. That's an, this makes, that makes this a very important example because while there can be up to five selections, we only need to draw three here because of the specific question that's being asked. So what we can do next is we can define a random variable, which is the random variable of interest here we could call it X, and that would be the number of selections required to get that green ball. So once we've defined X, then we can restate the question as, or the, the, what we're trying to find, which is the probability that X is less than or equal to three. So that's going to equal the probability that X is either one or two or three. So there's three separate probabilities that we need to figure out here. So what we can do now is to, is to draw the tree diagram. The tree diagram 
as much of it as as mentioned before as we need to draw so what that looks like is we you can see the first stage here has got either green or red and the probabilities will of course be two six for the green and four six for the red and i use we use subscripts here um, denoting the stage that we're at. So you can see that we have G1 and R1 simply to uh, denote here that these are green or red selections on the first, um, green or red ball for the first selection, et cetera, for the other selections as well. So you notice that there is no branching out coming from the G1 because if you pick a green on your first pick, you stop right there. And I'm using the circles here to circle the points that are sort of like terminal points. So if we get green on the first pick, we stop there. And so the probability that X equals one is just gonna be the probability of getting a green on the first pick, which would just be two six or one third. Now, if we pick a red ball on the first pick, then we have to pick again. And then once again, we'll either get a green or a red. Now, there's five balls left. And if the first ball was red, then there's, only, there's both green balls are still left. So the probability of getting a green for the second pick is two fifths. And there's only three of the four red balls left. So the probability of red, of course, is three fifths. And of course, two fifths and three fifths add up to one. And so the probability that X equals two, that must be the path where you go red and then green or red one and then green two. And, that, and the probability would simply be the product of the probabilities, which is four sixths times two fifths, um, which, which reduces to four over 15. And then to get the last, probability that we need, which is the probability that X equals three, we have to look at what happens if we get red on the first pick and then red on the second pick and now green on the third pick. That's what we're particularly interested in. So for that to happen now, the probability of getting a green on the third pick, well, you must have picked two reds from the first two. So there's now there's only four balls out of the six balls left uh, total balls left. So the denominator is going to be four and there's those two green balls that are still in the jar. So the probability of, of getting G3 is two out of four or one half. So the probability of X equaling three is simply the product of the pro of the probabilities on that path to get to that um, G3, which is four six times three fifth times two fourths, which reduces to one over five. So the answer to this question is one third plus four fifteenths plus one fifth. Now we need a common denominator, which is 15. So uh, we end up with five fifteenths plus four fifteenths plus three fifteenths, which equals 12 over 15, which reduces to four over five. So the probability of that three or fewer selections are acquired is equal to four fifths. In the previous lesson, we determined that two events A and B are independent with respect to each other, provided that the probability of A intersection B equals the product of the probability of A times the probability of B. If we substitute this equation into the rule for conditional probability that we looked at previously, we get the following important identity for independent events we would get probability of B given A equals the probability of B intersection A, which of course is the same as A intersection B, divided by the probability of A, which then if we make the substitution on top, we would replace the probability of A intersection B with the probability of A times the probability of B. And so we would end up with the probability of A on top and bottom and we can cancel them. So that leaves us with the probability of B given A just equaling the probability of B. And note, notice as well that uh, the reverse would also be true. In other words, the probability of A given B would similarly work out to be the probability of A. In other words, if two events A and B are independent, then we can say that the probability of B given A just equals the probability of B and the probability of A given B just equals the probability of A. What this says essentially is that the conditional probability of one event occurring given another event occurring is simply equal to the probability of the, the first event occurring or the first, the one before the given occurring if the two events are independent of each other. In other words, if two events are 
independent, then one has no influence on the other. So it shouldn't surprise us that the probability of B given A would just equal the probability of B. And likewise, the probability of A given B would just equal the probability of A because the events have no influence on each other. Furthermore, when two events A and B are independent, the conditional probabilities will be equal for a particular event given either the other event happening or its complement. In other words, the probability of B given A will also equal the probability of B given A complement because they both simply equal to the probability of B. Or more generally, for n possible outcomes related to stage A, the probability of B given A1 will equal the probability of B given A2, which will equal to so on and so forth, dot, 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 which will equal to the probability of B given A n, and they all simply equal to the probability of B if A and B are independent. Independent events can thus be spotted easily from a tree diagram because the corresponding conditional probabilities will all be equal as the following example shows. So if you look at example eight, you can see there's a tree diagram with uh, two stages and stage A, the first stage is, has three possible outcomes, A1, A2, and A3. And then the second stage has either B or B complement. And notice that we were using two different methods here for denoting outcomes. Notice that uh, in the case of stage B, since there's only two possible outcomes, we can use B and B complement. You notice that we don't use A and A complement for the, for the first stage A because there's actually more than two possible outcomes for A. So with the, the, the idea of an event and its complement doesn't quite work when you've got more than two. So we use the subscripts, that's more convenient, and we use A1, A2, and A3. Now, what's important in this example is to notice, and, it, and it's circled uh, in red for the Bs and in green, green for the B complements, is that regardless of what happens in the first stage, in other words, regardless of whether we have A1 or A2 or A3 occur, the probability of B, the conditional probability for B is always 0 0.9, which of course means that the conditional probability for B complement is always 0 0.1. So from this tree diagram, we can see that the probability of B is simply equal to 0 0.9, and the probability of B complement is equal to 0 0.1, regardless of whether the first stage outcome is A1, A2, or A3. So therefore, we can conclude from looking at this tree diagram that, that B is independent of A1, A2, and A3. Or we can simply say that B, that we can say that A and B are ind independent. When a set of events A1, A2, A3, and so on up to AN represents all possible outcomes related to a, a, to a particular stage of an experiment, then the sum of the probabilities of A1 through AN must equal one. We can therefore say that A1 through AN is what's called a partition of the entire sample space for the experiment. In example nine, we're given the following Venn diagram for a four-way partition of the sample space. Now this is a different way of using a Venn diagram. You can see in the diagram on the slide here that the overall rectangle, which is our universal um, set or our sample space has been split up or partitioned into four uh, separate regions and they're A1, A2, A3, and A4. If we now consider another event B, which can happen concurrently with any of A1 through A4, the Venn diagram will look as follows. And you see on the slide, we've got the partition a1, A2, A3, and A4 of the sample space. And then we can sort of lay across those four regions um, a sort of a enclosed uh, area shaded in blue that that is, that is the event B. And so what you can see on the diagram, we can label uh, the four parts of B uh, from left to right. We have A1 intersection B, A2 intersection B, all the way through A4 intersection B. The total probability of event B, therefore, can be expressed as the sum of the four intersections between B and the partition events A1 through A4. In other words, 
we can say that the probability of event B is equal to the probability of A1 intersection B plus the probability of A2 intersection B plus the probability of A3 intersection B plus the probability of A4 intersection B. And if we substitute uh, using the formula for the rearranged formula for uh, conditional probability, we can rewrite this as, therefore, the probability of B equals the probability of A1 times the probability of B given A1 plus the probability of A2 times the probability of B given A2 and so on, all the way through the probability of A4 times the probability of B given A4. The latter line here that you see, in other words, the last step in, in what we've just derived, that invokes the rule for conditional probability and can be seen clearly in the following tree diagram for the same example. So you can see the tree diagram here, which is just another way of representing that Venn diagram on the previous slide. So you can see the first stage shows A1, A2, A3, and A4 and the probabilities written on the branches are just the simple probabilities for A1 through A4. And then the second stage shows B or B complement. And you can see these the conditional probabilities are written onto the branches. And the probability of the total probability of B would be the sum of the products of the probabilities leading to those four um, red circle terminal points on the tree diagram. In general, if A1 through AN is a partition of the sample space with the sum of all the probabilities of each AI equaling one as they must, then for any event B, the probability of B is going to equal the sum of the products of each, the probability for each AI times the probability of B given that AI. So that will equal the probability of A1 times the probability of B given A1 plus and so on and so forth all the way up to the probability plus the probability of AN times the probability of B given AN. Conditional probabilities of the form probability B given AI are called a priori probabilities because they look forwards along a tree diagram and they typically represent the conditional probability of a subsequent event given the occurrence of a prior event. Now what that looks like the way we've been doing uh, the tree diagram so far is you would be reading you would be reading the probabilities we go from left to right and so we would basically be looking in chronological order um, from stage A to stage B subsequently. Such probabilities can be read straight off the tree diagrams from the second stage onwards. In other words, we can see those conditional probabilities sitting right there on the branch. On the other hand, conditional probabilities of the form P A I given B are called a posteriori probabilities because they look backwards along a tree diagram. And in many cases, they represent the conditional probability of a prior event given that a subsequent event has already occurred. Now, these are, this is like going from right to left, and it's sort of like going backwards in time chronologically. Such probabilities are not as easily read off a tree diagram. In other words, we can't see them sitting on the branches, but they can nonetheless be calculated as follows. We use the rule for conditional probability that says that the probability of AI given B equals the probability of AI intersection B divided by the probability of B. So what that gives us, therefore, is that the way it works out is for the numerator, we get the probability of AI intersection B equaling the probability of AI times the probability of B given AI. And the denom and that's, that's the simpler part of this fraction. The denominator is the total probability of B. Now, the numerator that we just worked out is, is basically the one path that gets us to B through AI. But the total probability of B, which is our denominator, that's actually the sum of all of the paths 
to B, which go through all of A1 through AN. So what we get in the denominator is the sum of the products of all the AIs times the probability of B given that AI. So that would give us the probability of A1 times the probability of B given A1 plus and so on and so forth, all the way up to plus the probability of AN times the probability of B given AN. And it should be noted here that the term in the numerator is actually going to be one of the N terms in the denominator. And that's essentially what we're doing. We're finding the probability of a specific path to be divided by the sum of the probabilities of all the paths to be. For example, 10. We have the situation where, based upon historical data, the sky at sunset on the eve of the summer solstice in a particular location is clear on 30% of days, partly cloudy on 50% of days, and cloudy on 20% of days. It is also known from this historical data that it rains the next day, 10% of the time, after a clear sunset the evening before, 30% of the time after a partly overcast sunset the evening before, and 50% of the time after an overcast sunset the evening before. Based on this information, we are asked to estimate the following. Firstly, in part A, the probability that it rains on the next summer solstice, and B, the probability that if it rains on the next summer solstice, it was clear at sunset on the evening before. So it's a pretty fulsome uh, problem and um, in terms of the, the, the word problem and how much is written there. So a very good place to start answering these questions is by trying to visualize it and a tree diagram is the recommended method to use. And as you'll see, uh, we're able to, we'll be able to fill in the tree diagram completely using the given information. It's just a matter of interpreting the information and um, it correctly so that you put it in the right place on the tree. So we can start. We can start. We can proceed from here by defining the relevant events as follows. So let's C equal the event that the sky is clear at sunset on the eve of the summer solstice. And then we can use, we can let P equal the event that the sky is partly overcast at sunset on the eve of the summer solstice. And O is the event that the sky is overcast at sunset on the eve of the summer solstice. And then um, what we're interested in here is whether it's going to rain or not the following day, which is the day of the summer solstice. So we can call that event R. R is the event that it rains on the summer solstice. So you can see the tree diagram here, and um, it, it's really just based on logic and common sense, the way we construct it. It, 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 it works in a sort of chronological order. So we can see here, starting from the left, we have this initial point from which radiates three branches. We have clear, partly overcast, and overcast, C, P, and O. And the probabilities for those three events are simple probabilities because it's the first stage and they're given to us in the problem. And so we have 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and 0.2 respectively. And from C, P, and O, now the second stage is either just that it rains or it doesn't rain the next day, which is the day of the solstice. And the probabilities that we're given, the other information that we're given, are the probabilities of R, of rain. And they are 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and 0 0.5 respectively. And the other probabilities, these are all conditional probabilities at the second stage. The other probabilities, which are for our complement, are simply we just uh, we, we use the uh, property that all branches radiating from a point have to add up to one. So, for example, if the probability of rain given that it's clear the night before is 0.1, the probability of our complement will just be 0.9. And then similarly, we get 0.7 and 0.5 for the other uh, second stage branches for our complement. And suddenly, our tree diagram is complete. We've got probabilities everywhere. So we could answer pretty we can answer any question really about this um, problem. Now, we'll start with A. A turns out to be the more straightforward one because it, A is asking for the probability that it rains on the summer solstice. And that's an a priori probability because we're moving forward in time. We're moving from left to right. So we see that there's three uh, paths that end in rain. So all we have to do is just um, multiply 
the branches, the probabilities along each of those paths, and then add the three results because there are three separate ways to get rain, either through a clear eave or a partly overcast eave or an overcast eave. And so the answer equals 0 0.3 times 0 0.1 plus 0 0.5 times 0 0.3 plus 0.2 times 0.5, and so that equals 0.03 plus 0.15 plus 0.1, and so we get a final probability of rain on the solstice of 0 0.28. Now, part B asks for the probability <coughs> that it was, that if it rains, what's the probability that it was clear the night before? Now, that's not as something as simple as the reverse. Say we were asked for the probability of rain given that it was clear. That would be just 0.1. We could just pick that off the tree. This is an a posteriori probability. And so we have to use that theorem of total probability, which says that the probability of, of clear given rain is going to equal the probability that we're in that first path, the one that's circled in green on the lower diagram, divided by the sum of all the probabilities that get us to rain. In other words, using the conditional probability formula, that gives us the probability of clear and rain divided by the probability of rain, which is the sum of the three paths that get to rain. Now, the denominator of this question is simply, you see the sum of the three products. That's just simply the answer from part A. We've already worked out the probability of rain, which is 0 0.28. So all we need to do is just divide that that particular path of clear and rain, which is 0.3 times 0.1, divided by all three paths. And notice that the 0.3 times 0.1 in the numerator is one of the probabilities on the bottom, and that's always the case. So the answer equals 0 0.03 divided by 0.28. In other words, 3 divided by 28, or 3 over 28, which rounds to 0 0.11. The following is a set of practice questions meant to provide a review of the material covered in this lesson. Question one, there are two events A and B such that the probability of A equals 0 0.40, the probability of B equals 0 0.35, and the probability of A union B equals 0 0.63 and we're asked to calculate the probability of B given A. So we start our answer by using the formula for conditional probability, which, which says that probability of B given A equals the probability of A intersect B over the probability of A. Now we have the probability of A given to us, but not the probability of the intersection. However, we can use the formula we've discussed previously that relates intersection with union and individual probabilities, which states that the probability of A intersect B equals the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A union B. So we make this our numerator and divide by the probability of A, which gives us 0.4 plus 0.35 minus 0.63 divided by 0.4 which equals 0.12 over 0.4, which is the same as 12 over 40, or 3 over 10, which is the same as 0 0.3. Question two. A sock drawer contains two white, two red, two blue, and two green socks. You're packing for a camping trip and you need to pack enough socks for two pairs. In other words, four socks in total. Unfortunately, the room is pitch dark. The socks all feel the same and you can only take out four socks from the drawer. Calculate the probability that you will end up with socks that make two matching pairs. This problem is actually fairly complicated, complex, but if we use the right techniques, we can break this down in a way that we get an um, efficient, elegant solution. So that's what we'll do. First, we'll, we'll make use of a tree diagram to sort of map out um, the way this, these selections can happen that, you know, that's relevant to what we're looking for. The other thing we can do is make note of the fact 
that we don't actually need to uh, label or track the four different colors because there's an equal number of each color. We have two of each color socks. So what that means is the probabilities is are the same for all the colors for any any particular number of those socks being selected. So instead, what we're interested in, and the only thing we actually need to track here, are what, what we, la we can label here as C1 and C2 and C3, which are the events respectively of choosing a sock of the first, second, and third different colors. We don't even need a C4, even though there are four colors here, and we are choosing four socks. So it's possible to choose uh, four different colors. But as this progresses, if, if, if we note uh, carefully, once we pick a third different color, it becomes impossible to get two matching pairs. Now, picking the third color can either happen on the third selection or the fourth selection. But in either event, uh, that happening May, would make this an unsuccessful attempt to get two matching pairs because two matching pairs in four socks means that we need two each of two different colors and there's no room for any other colors to be chosen. So we make note of that. So we only need C1, C2, and C3. And the way we'll draw the tree diagram here is uh, in one particular situation, if we get C1, then C2, and then C3, that means that at that point, after three selections, it doesn't matter what happens on the fourth selection. So we just uh, we just stop right there, and and we don't need to show the fourth stage in that in that scenario simply because no matter what happens, we will uh, be unsuccessful. Also note here that we will note uh, we will note successful pathways with a check mark, and unsuccessful pathways with an X. So starting at the beginning, the first stage is actually uh, very simple. Uh, there, there's eight socks, and all eight of them, no matter what the color they, are, no matter what the color will be a C1. It'll be our first color chosen. So there's just the eight over eight, which equals one uh, for that. Now for the second stage, either we choose again C1, which has a probability of one, the one other C1 sock out of the seven that are left. Otherwise, it's six out of seven are a second color, C2. Now, if, we, if our first two picks are C1, C1, then there's actually only one possibility again, because now we've used up that first color. So all six remaining socks uh, are of another color, whether it's any one of the three remaining colors. So there's a six and six or one probability of getting a C2. If our first two picks are C1, C2, then there's actually three possibilities. Either we get, of the, of the six remaining socks, uh, one of them will be uh, the other C1, so that's one-sixth. And likewise, one of them will be the other C2, so that's also one-sixth. Otherwise, there'll be four-sixth. The, the, the other four of the six remaining socks will be a C3, and that is... Um, is an unsuccessful pathway so we stop right there in that case now if our for the fourth stage the fourth stage pathways that we are interested in pursuing uh, we if if the the first three selections were c1 c1 c2 then our fourth selection will either be the other c2 there's one out of five or a C3, which is four to five, and the C2 is a successful pathway, and the C3 is a is an unsuccessful pathway. Similarly, if we choose C1, C2, C1, we also uh, have two C1s and a C2, and the order doesn't matter, so we end up with the same possibilities there of one fifth chance of C2, which is a success, or four fifths chance of a C3, which is not a success. And finally, if we have C1, C2, C2, then similarly, uh, we have one-fifth and four-fifth probabilities, but this time the one-fifth is for the other C1, and that's a successful pathway, or uh, four-fifths probability of a C3, which is an, an unsuccessful pathway. So putting this all together, the resulting tree diagram, we can see there's three successful pathways, either C1, C1, C2, C2, or C1, C2, C1, C2, or C1, C2, C2, C1. And the rest is just the mathematics of multiplying along pathways 
and uh, adding the pathways. It turns out, after all, and there's some factoring you can do uh, depending on how you um, uh, finish off the problem. What we actually end up with is all three pathways have an equal probability of 1 over 35, which actually is logical because in the end, they all have in common that they both have two of one color and two of another color. So it's not surprising that they they end up with the same probability. So what we finally end up with is a probability of two matching pairs equaling 3 over 35, which rounds to 0 0.086. Question 3. There are two coins in a hat. One of them is a fair coin with heads and tails sides, and the other is a biased coin with heads and tail sides as well, but with probability of heads equaling 0 0.8. One of these coins is randomly selected and then tossed, and we're asked to calculate the following. A, the probability that the coin comes up heads, and B, the probability that if the coin comes up tails, it's the biased coin. So once again, here's a problem where a tree diagram can be very helpful. So before we try to answer either parts A or B, we'll, we'll set up the tree diagram, complete it, and if so, we should be able to answer any relevant question related to it. So let's also uh, define some uh, names for events. Uh, we 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 already are familiar with using H and T to denote heads and tails. The other set of event names that we um, need is one for each of the two different types of coins because there's two there's two different coins here. One's a fair coin, so we'll call that F. F is the event that the fair coin is chosen, and B is the event that the bias coin is chosen. So if we proceed sort of chronologically, the first stage of this problem is the, the random selection of one of the two coins. So we can see here that the, the tree diagram starts with a split from the beginning point to either F or B. And since we're randomly selecting one of the coins, we can assume that uh, it's just a 50-50 uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 split of the probability in terms of which coin is chosen. So those are the probabilities that go on the first set of branches. And then from there, the second stage is simply that for each coin, we're either going to get heads or tails. For the fair coin, the probabilities are 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. For the bias coin, we're told that the probability of heads is 0 0.8. And so from that, we can uh, we can calculate the probability of tails being 1 minus 0 0.8, which equals 0 0.2. And now we have a complete tree diagram. Part A asks us to find the probability of getting heads in this experiment. So we can see in the diagram that there are two pathways that end with heads. So all we need to do is calculate the probability for each pathway, which is just the product of the probabilities on the branches for each path and then we add them. And so the answer becomes 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 times 0 0.8, which equals 0 0.25 plus 0 0.4, which equals 0 0.65. Now, for part B, we're asked a conditional probability, the key word being if. So the wording is, if the coin comes up tails, it's a biased coin. So we set up our conditional probability, careful to put the given event after the vertical line. So it's the, it's the fact that the coin is tails that's given, and we're asked to find the probability that it's biased based on that. So that would be the probability of B given T, which equals the probability of B intersect T over the probability of T. So the numerator, the probability of B intersect T is straightforward to get from the, the tree diagram. It's simply the product of the probabilities along that the branch uh, to B and then to T. So that's 0 0.5 times 0 0.2. And then the denominator, the probability of tails, well, we could simply find the sum of the two pathways, which is 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 times 0 0.2. 
Of course, in the previous part A, we figured out the probability of heads being 0.65, so we can use the complement rule and just go 1 minus probability of heads to get the probability of tails, which equals 0.35, so we'll do it that way here. So our final answer is 0.1 over 0.35, which equals 10 over 35, or 2 over 7, which rounds to 0.29. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from Ursa Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.